I'm really excited to be part of this adventure. Um, I, I guess I don't, I, 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 I don't need to welcome so many of you. You're already underway, but welcome to this session. A um, couple of words to begin about how I approach this um, topic. I am driven in my work by the ancient, ancient questions that have animated humanity forever, and I see being reborn in our young and tumultuous century, and certainly online. What does it mean to be human? How do we want to live? And who will we be to each other? For me, the internet is a new canvas for the old, old human condition. Its speed and scale are unprecedented, but nothing happens online that doesn't happen offline. And what happens online ripples through every material aspect of our world. Um, the 20th century Jesuit paleontologist, Teilhard de Chardin, foresaw something like the internet as the next stage of human evolution. He spoke of the noosphere, which comes from the Greek, Greek word for knowledge. And now we have, as he predicted, wrapped the biosphere in the noosphere. We have utterly imprinted our world with a web of human knowledge, thinking, creating, imagining, and interacting. And the quality of that imprint has been erratic, to say the least, in the Internet's infancy, which we are the generation of our species to usher in an experience. In just a handful of years, the digital world has had all of us learning and leading, working and playing, falling in love, waging battles, creating community, making and unmaking public life, on platforms that were not built with all of this in mind. And these platforms have not scaled when they scaled with the undergirding intention of proactively, pro-socially evolving humanity. But aspirationally, the digital realm also has given us the tools for the first time in the history of our species to think and act as a species. And I'm drawn, I was drawn to say yes to participating in this festival. I'm drawn to the new public initiative and the work so many of us are already doing in our different spheres as steps in that audacious direction. So this session is designed to quickly surface the range, to kind of stretch the canvas of the impulses and orientations and hopes and fears we bring to the matter of what safety means and can mean for us to accomplish all that we want to accomplish in a humane digital public sphere. Um, I'm sure this has been said before, but I will, I will say it again. It's a given of this gathering and of this conversation that what divides us is meaningful. What makes us different from each other is part of our individual vitality, and it's also part of the vitality of common life. The fact of friction and the intersectional intelligence that makes possible must be integrated hospitably and imaginatively into any high-functioning new public space we can create online or off. And we have a beautiful panel um, of um, individuals who, are, who inhabit an array of expertise and life experience along our digital and cultural spectrum. And each of them is already digging, digging into a corner of the digital world to design and protect it as a place of security and dignity and joy. Um, Catherine Mayer is CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, Anasuya Sengupta is founder of Whose Knowledge. John Samples is the vice president of the Cato Institute and a Facebook oversight board member. Eve Perlman, CEO of Spaceship Media, and Nathan Matias, the founder of Cornell's Citizen and Tech Lab. Um, I have a very basic, elemental, brief grounding exercise for everybody present, including the panelists, and that is just that I would invite you as we start to summon a memory of an experience you've had in digital space that was humanizing. And if you're lucky enough to have a lot of those, maybe think of the last one. Probably wasn't a flawless space. There aren't flawless human spaces, but a space that was congenial, even generative, 
where you liked the quality of presence that, that the space drew forth in you and in others, and where you, there was some discovery and stretching alongside comfort. Kind of let that memory root your imagination um, as we move forward. And we are going to be moving from here on out as we converse. Um, our panelists will use their hands while everybody else will be moving around online. I'm going to offer four prompts to lay this converse, conversational space and position it in terms of the tensions and reckonings that, again, kind of stretch the canvas of our current digital life together. Everybody attending is invited to locate around the tensions and maybe fluidly circle and move around them as the conversation progresses, as our panelists share more of their, their perspectives on and, and you'll be doing that on this spatial Miro map. So I open the hour by invoking cosmic as aspirational terms uh, and, uh, <laughs> and hopes, but each of us come to this with no small amount of trauma and a reality-based seriousness and reserve. Um, so the first tension, we're not gonna really launch into a conversation, but I do kind of want to take the temperature in the room. There was a conversation as we were, as we were planning this about making the elephant in the room visible. And, and I think what I want to do is just, just get honest about how hopeful we feel being present to this right now. Um, so here's the tension, the question, for the foreseeable future, the digital public sphere will be a place where a healthier interaction becomes more visible and more defining, or B, harm is mitigated reactively. So healthier interaction becomes more visible and defining is A, harm is mitigated reactively is B. John, are you in the middle? I am because I don't, <laughs> I'm very wary of making projections about, especially about the future at this mm -hmm. moment in time. Yeah. Well, let's move into tension two, where we kind of really leap into the, the meat of this. Um, again, we're stretching the canvas of how we're reckoning right now with this. Um, and then we want to explore the space in between. I think none of us wants to live with these as either ors. Um, okay, the primary purpose of digital safety is A, inclusive presence, B, courageous engagement. The primary purpose of digital safety is uh, inclusive presence is A, and courageous engagement is B. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody. <laughs> I, I think I'm just going to ask for an interpretation of those creative hand movements. Uh, Nathan, I saw yours first. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, I believe, and I've seen in the research evidence that those two actually go together. That mm. When you have in, like inclusion and the freedom to be courageous, do often coexist. Um, Catherine, you, uh, Wikimedia has this vision that all human beings can freely share in the sum of all human knowledge and and safety seems to be a prerequisite prerequisite in that vision for all the components that would make that that possible. Yes, I, I think I wavered on the on the line only because I feel as though if I had to lean into making a determination one way or another, I would head towards inclusive presence. Sometimes courage, when we manifest it is a way of, of, of disregarding the space around us. And so for me, that inclusive presence piece actually feels as though it, it is the primary directive when we really think about those tensions. Anasuya, I'm, I'd love to know what you're thinking. You, um, I would say um, whose knowledge, the organization you founded centers, or the centers the leadership of multi-ethnic communities. Um, not just multi-ethnic, but marginalized communities, marginalized mm -hmm. by power and privilege of different kinds. And for me, the reason um, 
I'm in the middle is, is similar to Nate's, which is that I do have issues with the word inclusion, which we can talk about another time. Mm. But um, I think from the perspective of my own experiences and the experiences of the communities I work with, without a space in which people feel welcome and included, they cannot be um, courageous. And often their act of being, whether online or offline, in a space is itself an act of courage. Are we learning? Good. Could I ask something here? Yes, you could. Please do. So I think I'm. Uh, <laughs> uh, I this is not language that I'm usually uh, accustomed to when I talk about these things. Uh, I come out of a First Amendment tradition, a classically liberal tradition. I'm used to thinking about what Justice Holmes said or something like that. So I, I think I missed your the import of what you said because I. Uh, and I think it's also most valuable for me just to talk about Facebook uh, to the extent I can with the proviso that I'm just one member of the board. I'm not talking for the entire board. So when I think about safety, I think about Facebook's community standards, um, which uh, have essentially look forward to uh, voice being a paramount value in the terms selected by Facebook and that safety is a counterbalancing value. So that when uh, voice uh, in some circumstances uh, goes against that, goes against safety, it uh, safety trumps. Uh, the typical situation is a typical situation in many places, which is incitement to violence. Now, I think the interesting question, the next and point I would like to make here is I, I, these values or where I set myself in this uh, at the start of my work at the Facebook oversight board is really, I mean, I don't know. I just went through a deliberation about a case where people started out in different places and ended up uh, at another place, including me, I think, actually. And that's because you're faced with a, a set of particular facts. These are ideas, values, and you imagine that you might imagine that you're going to go through time and just apply these. That's a rationalist conceit, right? That you can come up with the theory first and then just apply it. The fact is, this thing is only going to work, uh, the oversight board's only going to work if it slowly goes through time, figuring out a set of circumstances and drawing a set of lines. So I can draw a line today, but these people, these 20 people, these 40 people working in groups of five are going to draw those lines over time. Uh, about safety or anything else. Uh, and there'll be a number of factors involved in that, but it'll be done through deliberation. You talk about humanizing experiences. My work this week with four other people uh, was uh, the most recent humanizing experience online because we have different values, different views, and we worked, we talked through it. Now, I'm very skeptical that you can talk through things in groups of larger than seven, five, six, seven, and come to that same conclusion. But this is a practical enterprise, not a theoretical one. Hmm. Thank you. Eve, do you want to add anything to this? And, and not so much. I don't, I, I just am struggling to see these things as, I think, like many others, as oppositional in, in, in any way. But, but Yeah, I agree. And I actually think the point of the exercise is to is to talk about what comes, what is between them. Yeah. Um, so that I, that's that's really my interest as well. Um, so let's feel free to go there. This is not yeah. a problem. It's not a problem <laughs> that you don't feel all A or all B. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think in our work, Spaceship hosts conversations um, with groups of people on opposite sides of difficult issues, and and. Um, you know, we're driving towards all the things that you mentioned in your intro, which is how to hold space, how to drive towards authenticity, and how to um, be a, a, a part of a, a vibrant society and understand what we can be to one another. So, mm -hmm. you know, these, these are uh, aspirational terms. Yes. One of the key words for New Public is, is the idea of welcome. And that makes me think of... Um, also of hospitality, which I think is really a social technology that has such 
incredible, it's such a such an array of expressions and rituals attached in every human culture. It really is social technology for bringing your your own welcoming self and inviting other people into the room. And hospitality doesn't assume likeness or agreement or uh, or, or or intimacy. Um, so, but I so on this question, and I think this gets at some of the um, this next tension that was defined. Kind of gets at some of how do we how do we how do we define these spaces then that make both? Uh, yeah, I also I also have my problems with the word inclusion. Honestly, you said that could be, could be another, uh, but it, uh, the, every that everyone it can be present. The full array of humanity feels welcome. Let's say that and courageous engagement. Um, so here's a here's a tension. Um, you know how do we how do we start to uh, make that possible in practical terms and in terms of the ethos we create and the rules we create? So hospitality or welcome ends when a would be one person feels unsafe and b would be rules have been breached. Um, so a one person feels unsafe, b Rules have been breached. Um, and how do we want to talk about the space between those things? Let me start. I'm over on B. Uh, and I see that. Uh, so the, and to go back to the framework I suggested, voice and then safety and some other values as um, kind of uh, uh, balancing or however you think about it. Uh, the issue rem seems to me to be safety is, what is that? Is it, it's a feeling a person would have in their mind. What can you do about objectively? The other thing is, I think, and I'm perhaps different than others here in that I uh, see the world as not just a matter of values, philosophy, and ancient questions, but rather as politics which is a very hard business and can be a very, may be a very hard business in the days to come in the United States. And so the other side of it is uh, if people, people do it certainly, people do not wish to hear. What most people wish is to talk and not listen, right? Not have to listen. Having to listen is bad, hard, difficult, and it can make you feel unsafe. So you can say you're unsafe, you can say you're offended, you can say your religion has been blasphemy. There's all sorts of reasons that you can come up with uh, to call upon people to not have other people talk. And I hasten to add at this point, this is a very generalized thing. The, the, there's something about humans, I think, about that. I wish it were otherwise uh, about uh, listening and not, about talking and not hearing and about government and about uh, quasi-government uh, entities, but it's true. So safety has to have an objective meaning, and I think that can be determined pragmatically through deliberation, at least in my job. Perhaps that's a good uh, possibility for others, I hope, but it has to be objective, otherwise you're just unleashing the possibility of something like a heckler's veto uh, that is to say, people get to decide whether other people get to talk or not. Okay. Other thoughts? Isn't it true that I, a person feels unsafe when rules are breached? I think the two go hand in hand. Um, I think one feeds the other. Can I yes. come in on this? Mm -hmm. Who makes the rules? Right. I, I want to say where I agree with uh, John, where I at least meet John, because surprise, I do meet him on, on a particular aspect, which is that I, I agree this is about politics. It is about politics. It's about power. It is about political with a small P. And as we've seen, it is also about politics with a big P. And where I disagree with him, is entirely on the liberal foundations of what we're talking about. These notions of rules are liberal values and they're liberal politics that are based on centuries 
of colonialism and capitalism meeting in an unholy alliance of a particular set of rules for a particular set of people. It's not just about the one person feeling unsafe, often in online and in offline spaces, depending on the majoritarian practice of what a public space is and who has designed it, the first person feeling unsafe is often the person most marginalized, most vulnerable in that public space. And the reason for that is that the rules have been constructed such that those who have power and privilege in that public space are primarily protected. It's not hard to go to think about this as what happened last week on, on the Capitol, right? Um, we've been talking about it for a week and I need to bring it up because the way that it felt to watch what happened on Capitol Hill last week is the way that many black, brown, global south, indigenous, trans, non-binary folks, marginalized folks of different kinds, people who don't speak English, feel on the internet if they were on the inside of the Capitol and being stormed by domestic terrorists, by people for whom safety was clearly not an issue unless it was their own safety, unless it was the safety of people who looked like them. And, oh. and just, the, just a few months previously, Black Lives Matter protests were treated very differently. The capital is built with slave labor. The DC is built with slave labor. The internet is often built with an equivalent of it. Content moderation, for instance, when we're talking about rules being breached, content moderation farms are dehumanizing farms of human labor. So even as we talk about who is talking at Facebook, John, the privilege you have of having the debates you have, I don't have that privilege. Every time I have spoken with people at Facebook, I have not been listened to, my communities have not been listened to, our accounts have been taken down because we have been seen as spreading terror or being disrespectful rather than the ones being violated and being harassed. So rules are a very slippery word covering mm -hmm. a multitude of sins. I wonder... So could I reply? Because I think this is, I have a very different conception of what liberal values are. And I think there's a central problem here. Um, yeah, we're, we need to move really quickly. So, and I, and I don't think we have time to... Um... One sentence. Yep. Liberalism yep. is the philosophy you have for people who can live to find a way to live together with deep substantive differences. Mm -hmm. Read your Thomas Hobbes. You see, you find out what a society is that isn't. And how liberalism came out of that society. That society, religious differences. Yeah, and, and, life, and life for those who who disagree with that particular version is nasty, brutish, and short. I happen to have read my Hobbes. Uh, I I, I want to ask a slightly different version a version of that, which which would be and and really I'm kind of looking at. Well, I'm Nathan and and Catherine and, and Eve. I I feel like you both are um, on some front lines where we're. Are we learning things both through behavioral sciences, which Nathan, I think is more your field, and through places where harassment and ex ex excess online is, is being, I would say, <laughs> what does successful mean, but successfully navigated, at least in instances. Are we learning things that inform um, how rules might be made in a way that that takes account of all this complexity. I, I don't, I, we'll go, to, go on. I just wanna talk a little bit about how I think about hospitality, hospitality um, in our, I think about it as, um, as uh, an ongoing exercise in, in welcoming people in the conversations that I hold. And I think about it as a 
practice and I think about extending it as far and as long as I can. Um, someone commented in the chat about um, how they benefited from being holding themselves into places where they originally felt unsafe um, and, and had discovery there in connection as, once they passed through uh, some of the fear. And so I think you referenced at the beginning, Krista, we all carry trauma. We're all, um, I assume the vast majority of us are hopeful, well-intentioned, trying to push towards better things. Um, and so I extend my hospitality and I invite the people that we are in conversation with to do that to the best of their ability as much as they can, assuming we are working to be forces for good. And, I, and, and to the rules question, I'm not very good at, at rules, um, but I just, I find things work best when I am guided by an inherent respect for my fellow human beings mm -hmm. and all the things that I think mo the vast majority of us, again, were taught as we grew to do onto others, to, to, to try to be good actors. And so I, I try to live in those spaces and encourage the people around me to do that. Um, it doesn't relate so much to the Facebook policy or to the other pieces of all the complexity of that, but I drive from those feelings. Nathan? Yeah, so I'll start with hospitality and then, then move to some thoughts from, from research. You know, hospitality is one of those deep and long and like fundamental uh, building blocks of society. And as you know, any of us who've read Homer's Odyssey know, uh, it carries incredible risk and it can enable deep injustice. Hospitality is what keeps Odysseus alive from place to place. It's also what imprisons Penelope and creates a terrible situation for her. And I think, uh, you know, when we go into social contexts, uh, we, you know, a, a lot of people have very real fears. You know, if you look at the research by Civic Signals, out of 15 platforms, only one had a high performance rating on safety and over half of them actually rated people who were super users of the platform rated safety as one of the lowest like rate ranking like values and, and characteristics of those platforms. And you know we see this uh, in nationally representative surveys like between 40 to 53 percent of Americans have faced some kind of online harassment and uh, much of that is, you know, involves risks of violence. Much of that is directed towards some of the most vulnerable in society. But I think John pointed out something really important, that there's a distinction between fears and fearfulness. Marilyn Robinson has this beautiful essay about fear uh, from a few years ago. And one of the things that research can do, that evidence can do, one of the reasons uh, evidence is so important to making online communities safer is that it helps us differentiate between unfounded fears and like very real risks. And that's where uh, research of the kind that people do inside of companies and also research of the kind that uh, community scientists like the ones that we work with at Cat Lab who work to understand and, and develop testable solutions for actually making online communities safer is so important. I think that, I don't know that I have much to add on the point of, of hospitality. I, I do wanna say perhaps as someone who represents a platform in practice is that we really think about what welcome means, but I want to validate the questions and concerns that have been raised by those in the chat about who welcoming centers with the idea of the host and the precarity of the position of the hosted, that welcoming only really truly works when we transition from those who welcome to the who are welcomed, becoming as a sentence. But this idea that if one is constantly in a host and the other is constantly being received positions, mm -hmm. we're not truly creating spaces in which people have agency. The thing that I have thought, I think brings this brings up for me in regards to these rules and clarity is I really do want to validate what Anasuya said around where norms come from. Norms come from the aggregated historical positions of privilege and power that are set in unspoken ways. And while rules 
tend to have real value. Rules can be incredibly useful in creating clarity that helps people negotiate amb ambiguity within spaces. We need to think about where those rules come from and rules tend to be built off established norms and norms are those that are set by those in power. And so if we're not looking at the basis of the rules within our communities, whether they're online communities or in real life, and Krista, I completely agree, there really is no distinction between the two. The only thing that I would note is that norms at the scale of our societies emerged from smaller communal, communal structures than the scale that the internet exists in today. Mm -hmm. And the rapidity in which that has evolved has prevented us from the create, not prevented, but has, we have not had the opportunity to create norms at scale in the same way, but we are trying to create rules off those norms without interrogating from whence those norms came. So that feels sort of like, that's how I think about this in terms of evaluating when we think about rules. Yes, there's real value in that clarity and structure. It helps us account, create accountability. It also helps those who are new to situations navigate them with greater assurance of how they will be valued and respected and what their recourse is. And yet those rules can in fact, as Anasu has already said, hide a multitude of, of problems and sins. And, and so, rules alone don't create an ethos. They do not. They mm -hmm. do not. Mm -hmm. So I I'd like to make a point that's uh, related to your earlier, uh, Krista's point about ancient questions. Now, what's just been said, actually, is an ancient question that begins with the dialogue of a man named Thrasymachus and a man named Socrates, and it's recounted in Plato's Republic. And what Christine, uh, Catherine has just said is that for the time being, uh, Thrasymachus is winning. At least in our moment in this day, Thrasymachus is winning. Thrasymachus uh, was a, a number of things, but he stood for the proposition that norms, power, government is all just a reflection of who's powerful and who. Um, we remember Plato's name also because the, the dialogue there is Socrates' attempt and also Plato's attempt to uh, overcome that. So this is part of a dialogue. And right now we're living through a time where Thrasymachus seems to have swept the field. And history is long. He may not have won. Um, let's briefly touch on the final tension, um, which is an enormous question that we do not have to have time to litigate here. Um, which is about who is responsible for keeping people safe online. Um, and let's touch on that and put that out there and then, and then have a little bit of reflection before we close. Um, so tension number four, the body responsible for keeping people safe online is A, the government, B, platforms. So the government is A, the body responsible for keeping people safe online. A, the government, B, platforms. I'm thinking of this in the context of, of this very real debate that we're, the conversation that we're having right now and mm -hmm. the obligations of platforms under business and human rights principles, what the, what the, where those, the limits of those obligations are and where the obligations of governments begin to their citizens and the complications that that are implicit in presuming governments are in fact representative of their peoples we are sitting here having this conversation presumably most of us in in the the west in countries that are nominally democratic and yet have legacies of oppression abuse and marginalization for those who have been excluded from power and who have never provided physical safety for many of their citizens. And so I just, yes, there are these normative expectations of who is responsible. And also those normative expectations or those rules that we've just been discussing have failed. And so I'm holding my, my face because I'm saying, I. This, it feels, I mean, yes, there's these abstracted notions of who bears this responsibility, but let's, but they start to fall apart in practice very, very quickly. Um, and so perhaps that would be where I would find the merit in the conversation. In, uh, forgive me. 
Well, I believe, Catherine, that they fall apart in application because people don't understand. Like the general public doesn't understand. And so I think the question becomes, how do we help the general public have agency to govern themselves and to understand what that even means? What does that look like for a 16 year old to know how to govern themselves on TikTok or Facebook or Instagram? Um, and so when you give a 16 year old a driver's license, you send them to driver's license school. Um, so I think that becomes the question. You know, the general public needs to understand what that agency looks like. Um, Eve, I'm curious how you how you react to this uh, because you are you're working in the field of journalism and what you what you call dialogue journalism. And and you know the the thing about these two polls is that they leave a lot, they leave other actors out. Yeah, the polls break my head, um, but. Um, you know, I, I've moderated comments online for as long as that's been a part of our culture. And one of the interesting things that I, that I hit is when people um, just push and push and push to the limits of, you know, they'll amp up their name calling, their insults, their vitriol, and then waiting to be stopped by someone else. Mm. And what we work with people in our conversation is to, um, on awareness of their behavior, their impact. And so um, it, I begin to, to sound, you know, I, I'm very interested in each of us as actors in our lives with agency, um, how we are. And so are that and some I'm working on a project now where I'm just pushing a community group to back towards uh, not calling each other names immediately. Um, so I think a lot about mm -hmm. all of us as actors and, and all of us need mm -hmm. to be working hard to uh, think about the complexity of and the remedies for and how to rebuild a culture um, of, of a different kind of engagement. You know, I think what I'd like to do for our last few minutes is you just offered something really concrete, you know, and, and before the digital sphere, we might not have thought that we would, that that would be a subject we would have to take up, but it, it can make a huge difference as we kind of grow up, which is how I think of it, our digital life together. I, I'd love, you're each working in different spheres, coming at this from different directions. Maybe just, I'd like each of you to offer something that is being learned where you're working that feels additive to uh, to becoming whole? Well, I'd like to intervene here because I've already said that about deliberation. I'd like to make a point about the last uh, tension, which is this. Uh, in the last week in the United States, uh, many people will believe, many people do believe, tens of millions of people, I think, will probably believe that the platforms have acted in a way that is supportive of government or is following government. Uh, and many people, I think, listening to this, and many people in general may believe that was a great thing in the United States uh, this week. The problem with having government involved is you may not be so happy the next time government and the platforms are doing the same thing together or that the platforms are being responsive to the government. That's the central problem here. We can't imagine. And it's a central mistake made in all speech and civil liberties issues is to imagine that the government is obviously going to do the obviously right thing, which it turns out I know. It's just random or worse than random. It's government is uh, problematic in a lot of ways. You can't assume it's going to be a positive force. Uh, and that's also true of the platforms in particular because they're very responsive to the government would, would appear. Anasuya? Well, I come from India. I'm Indian. I'm a citizen of India. So for one, paradoxes uh, are part of my DNA. Um, I don't see binaries. I see, I see polarities. And this one is a hard one because it assumes a monolithic notion of government and it assumes a monolithic notion of platform or corporations. In practice, 
these are deeply in collusion with each other. So the reason I was kind of in the middle, but sort of on the side of government, even though I'm a citizen of the largest electoral demo democracy in the world, which is India, which has caused the highest number of internet shutdowns in the world in 2020, which has shut down enormous uh, swathes of my people because they are in resistance to a right-wing upper caste Hindu fascist state as it stands right now, um, is because the responsibility has to go hand in hand with accountability and transparency. And while these are complex issues, exactly as we're saying, so there are no neat and clean uh, binary answers, in at least you know, the social contract of supposedly democratically elected governments, and I'm making that the context, um, accountability and the social contract to the people have a far greater transparency than corporations. And that is the concern that I sit with in terms of being on one side or the other, but certainly on the side of, oh, platforms will you know, do the right thing. We know they haven't. If they have done the right thing last week, they have done the right thing because it happened in the US, because the optics of US citizens was on it, because the global, uh, the rest of the world was in shock because it would affect US relations with the rest of the world. What the platforms have allowed to happen over decades, right, in the rest of the world is completely ignored. At the same time as the Modi government in India was shutting down internet access in Kashmir during the world's largest mass blinding ever, please look it up for those who don't know, 2016, Modi was being wildly received with joy in Silicon Valley because Facebook and because India is Facebook and other platforms largest market. That is where money is. That is where power is. And so these are not binaries. There's a great collusion between markets and governments. And as people have pointed out in the in the chat, the struggle for individuals is how do we understand these complexities of institutional actors colluding mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than making us feel safe. Nathan, uh, last word, last reflection. Thank you, Kristen. I, I think back to one of the previous creative tensions we talked about, this like reactive or proactive one. And I want to build on this essential discussion of responsibility and accountability to point out that you know, even if a party is responsible for something, we might say that a tech company could have designed things differently or the way they ran things led to some problem, that doesn't necessarily mean that the people responsible for a problem uh, are or even should be uh, or are able to solve the problem. And I think the thing that I would encourage everyone here to ask is, even as we ask who's responsible, we should also ask what, what can be done to actually work towards a safer, like more understanding internet and how can we uh, build those uh, approaches, not only on debates over who is right or who is wrong, what the right decision is, what the wrong decision is, that takes us back into that user-centered world mm -hmm. that we heard about yesterday. And if we really want to move towards a world where we're caring about healthy and flourishing publics, then that really means uh, you know, focusing on who can be most effective at creating that world, and I would argue, building that on uh, reliable evidence. Catherine, I guess you get the last word, or you get the last reflection, and then I'll say, I'll, I'll get I the last word. I was going to say, as a Wikimedian, I don't think anyone ever gets the last <laughs> word, but, um, <laughs> but, but I actually was going to pick up on something in the chat, because I, I you know, you did ask Krista the question of, of the of practice. Mm -hmm. um, 
And there was this discussion in the chat about how decentralization as a model of governance can work. And I think perhaps we at Wikimedia are an, an imperfect model. I want to be very clear, actually, I, I, I had some discomfort coming into this discussion in general, because I don't view ourselves as a model of safety, not for individuals, nor for these questions of white supremacy and who holds narratives and who controls policies. Um, but we are engaged in an active dialogue around that. And, and I think that that is, is part of, of why I did want, want to be able to be here. But, um, but in decentralization, I think one of the things that, that we have found in trying to think about how to apply things like a code of conduct that could apply across 300 different languages, many different countries, cultures, experiences, is that you do still need to have some unify. And I, I'm going to use these words again, like you do need to have some sort of unifying norms around or values around which a community can coalesce that are upheld through then those rules which are made explicit. We, and what we're trying to do is to actually create ways in which the application of those rules is decentralized or the application of those values is decentralized. And so it's it, it I think it becomes problematic in practice if you have wildly decentralized values because you lack the ability to have a coherent accountability to some sort of normative expectations about what community actually is but the ability to apply an accountability through decentralized models is actually far more sustainable and resilient in both the development of the capacity for individuals to set those norms within their communities uphold those norms within their communities in ways that make them um, that embed them more deeply uh, and so that's just something that we're, we are experimenting with a, a jury's out, uh, you know, ask me again in a year or two, how that, how that's sort of playing out. But I did want to pick up on that question of decentralization. I think there, there's a, has to be a, there is a tension between needing to have some agreed upon values or norms for that space within the conversation of what decentralized application actually looks like. Uh, um, and it's something that we are trying to work through right now. Um, thank you all. Um... We just opened. We just opened this up, and there are more questions and answers. But I personally believe that questions are one of the mightiest forms of words that we possess. And I know there were more questions in the chat, and so we, if we, if all we've done is populate this landscape um, with the questions we're holding, uh, that's that's a contribution. I have to say, you know, when you talk about need, the need for unifying norms and values, we, we're so far from that in our analog public life. Um, and we were going to have to be recreating civic life and public life anyway, you know, even if our po politics weren't, was not in disarray. Um, th this makes me wonder, uh, and I'm a bit surprised to wonder this, if, if what's being if the questions posed, the inquiry pursued, the the learnings made, the experiments, like like the one you just described, and the one you the ones you've all described at different points, um, if the digital world is you know might be capable of pointing the way forward for um, our flesh and blood world, uh, not tomorrow, but maybe in generational time. Um, I have so many questions left. I do want to point out, I just want to throw this into the room because one of the things that came up when we all met um, before this is, you know, Anasuya, you saying recognizing safety is a low bar. Uh, and I think, Eve, you said something like, you know, you were prompted to, to do your work because of the acceleration of ugly. Um, but but what we want is to design beyond safety. We want to get beyond safety that is mere security. We want to get to pleasure and creativity and joy. Um, so I just want to let that um, enter the room as well, knowing that we're very far from it, but that that, I believe, is a shared human aspiration. So thank you to New Public for having us, for having me, and for hosting this conversation. Thanks so much. Thanks.